Good morning and welcome to First Baptist Church, Brayton, California. This is the first Sunday in October and we're just thankful to have a bright and sunny day out there. A little chilly right now but a little bit later on in a couple of hours we'll be having our worship service outside uh, and so we look forward to that. Look forward to the good weather. Just asking everybody for prayers for um, our president, president of the United States, and the first lady, and all of those who have been inflicted, impacted by the uh, coronavirus. Um, asking God to heal them all and to help heal this land and bring them all back to God. If my people would humbly pray, then I will heal them. I will heal their land. All right, we're going to do Down at the Cross. Down at the cross where the Savior died Down where from cleansing from sin I cried There to my heart was the blood of life Glory to his name Glory to his name Glory to his name study in there. We're on uh, uh, chapter 9 right now, and it is just amazing how many times it mentions uh, that they do everything that they're doing in his name, his name, of course, being Jesus Christ. It's very used a lot, that term, in his name. Okay, count your blessings. I believe if you're you have a hymnal, number 644. Count your blessings. And indeed, you know, I was saying to somebody the other day, uh, talking about the kids being out of school, and I said, there's a blessing, there's many blessings that the kids aren't in school right now. And somebody said, well, you don't have kids, do you? And I said, no, I don't. But then I told them what the blessing was, and it's with the kids not being in school, they're not being fed a lot of the, the things that kids are fed in school that they shouldn't be uh, fed. Fed as in taught, you know, things that they're taught that are putting put into the brains. And also that they get to spend more time with the parents. The whole world has had to slow down because of the virus. 
the pandemic that's going on. It's always important that we can find blessings in everything that's going on in our life. Because you know why? God is always, indeed, he's always moving. When upon life's pillows you are tempted, tossed. When you are discouraged, thinking all is lost. Count your many blessings, name them one by one. And it will surprise you what the Lord hath done. Count your blessings, name them one by one. Count your blessings, see what God has done. Count your blessings, name them one by one. Count your many blessings, see what God hath done. Are you ever burdened with a load of care? When the cross seem heavy, you are called to bear. Count your many blessings, every doubt will fly. And you will be singing as the day goes by. Count your blessings, name them one by one. Count your blessings, see what God has done. Count your blessings, name them one by one. Count your many blessings, see what God has done. When you look at others with their lands and gold, think that Christ has promised you his wealth untold. Count your many blessings, money cannot buy. Your reward in heaven, know your home and eyes. Count your blessings, name them one by one. Count your blessings, see what God has done. Count your blessings, name them one by one. Count your many blessings, see what God has done. So amid the conflict, whether great or small, do not be discouraged, God is over all. Count your many blessings, angels will attend. Help and comfort give you to your journey's end. Count your blessings, name them one by one. Count your blessings, see what God has done. So indeed, I hope that you do do that, that you count your blessings. See, indeed, what God has done. The uh, pastor sermon today is out of Proverbs. I believe, hold on, I have it right here. <laughs> His Bible is right here. <laughs> Proverbs 5. Uh, and it's on... Uh, fidelity 5 1 through 14 so open up your Bibles to Proverbs 5 1 through 14 fidelity pastor well good morning and for those of you that might have been able to find our uh, uh, Baptist hymnal online, and you may wonder if you have trouble finding the, the uh, worship songs on the page numbers or, or worship numbers that she gives. It's the sixth printing, copyright 1991, she's mm -hmm. using. And so that's if you're having trouble finding them, that's where it is. It's a sixth printing because there's lots of printings. I don't know what they're up to now because I think that was... It's in 1991, and we've got some six printings that are a little older than that here. Okay, so, um, yes, we still have to do these on, online, and we'll probably continue these. I think it's almost a certainty when we can meet back in church today. It's smoky outside, but it's it's a $10,000 fine if we meet indoors for worship, so we'll be out in the parking lot and, and be obedient to our authorities. So, at any rate, we're going to be uh, looking at Proverbs. Chapter 5, 1 through 14, talking about fidelity. And I would just want to think for a second, have you ever fallen short of being obedient to God? I mean, in anything. You know, I 
you been obedient? Have you been falling short? Have you ever seen anyone else being disobedient to God? Usually it's easier to see somebody else's shortcomings than our own. But either way, yours or somebody else, have you ever seen these? Well, guess what? There's a hint about this in Proverbs. There's a hint about where the problem comes from. Uh, so one of the things that we are to glean from today's verses is that we all need to work on improving our Christian ethics. And if you don't think you do, maybe you should ask somebody else if, if they see anything you need to work on. A uh, good chance uh, they, they might be able to find something. But the central idea of the text is that our fidelity starts in being pure in our hearts. That's where it starts. So if you open to Proverbs chapter 5, verse 1, and in case you might not know it, if there might be one or two people that don't that are listening to this, uh, Proverbs is written by King Solomon. Well, the first thing we see in verses 1 and 2 is that our fidelity has its roots in discernment. That's where it starts. We, fidelity has its roots in discernment. Uh, verses 1 and 2. My son, pay attention to my wisdom. Listen closely to my understanding that so that you maintain discretion and your lips safeguard knowledge. So what we see here in these two verses, Solomon is telling us we need to discern God's instructions and warnings. That's ultimately what he is saying. Now he is addressing his son here, or with other sons that he has, more sons, but he is addressing his son. Now for those of you who have children, how well did you find that your children listened to your advice. If you've never had children, think about how well, you're, how well you listen to the advice of your parents. Now what Solomon is saying, it applies to all of us when we are in the presence of the Lord. Now to be taught includes listening deeply and sincerely, seeking to know and understand the truth from the teacher. Just being able to repeat the words does not mean you're listening. Many people are married when the spouse says, did you hear what I said? And they repeat the words. All they've shown is they've memorized the words and repeated them. It does not mean they actually listened to what was said. Now, if Solomon's son follows the advice he has given, he would have developed the skills needed to discern the truth out of information or to make wise decisions. It is from this advice from Solomon, his son and us can learn how to avoid temptations that will lead to, <coughs> excuse me, disastrous results. Jesus told us he was the way. He also told us he was the truth. And finally, he instructed no one can come to God except through him. John 14, 6, I am the way, the truth, and no one comes to the Father except through me. Now, Jesus sent us one who could teach and guide us. He is called the Holy Spirit. John 14, 26. But the counselor, the Holy Spirit, the Father will send him in my name and will teach you all things, remind you of everything I have told you. So we all have a teacher from God in us if we are believers in Christ, the Holy Spirit. Jesus also instructed people and the churches to listen to the Holy Spirit. Revelation 2, 7. Anyone who has an ear should listen to what the Spirit says to the churches. Who is the church? The body of believers. Now, actually, that's really a very important verse in 2.7 because it's out of one of the seven letters to the seven churches that the Apostle John was instructed to give these letters to as they were dictated by, by Jesus. And they all end the same way. Listen to the Holy Spirit. That's something to keep in mind. So it must be important. It's repeated seven times. Chapters 2 and 3 of the book of Revelation. Now, being able to properly use discretion in these verses from Solomon is important. We lose discretion by manipulation, disobedience, and denial. Denial puts us in a position to actually be lying about situations. Safeguarding knowledge is also very important. It is speaking the truth. This is not the truth as we would like it to be. This is not the truth that we feel it should be. This is the truth as shown in the scriptures when properly interpreted. 
Now, you show fidelity following Solomon's advice on discernment. Now, this is a very interesting uh, chapter in Proverbs, chapter 5, because what happens is Solomon gives his own illustration to verses 1 and 2. He actually does, if you do a lot of us do sermons, where we tell you about some verses and what they mean, and then we give you an illustration how to apply them. Well, Solomon does that right here. Because he gives an illustration after verses 1 and 2. And that's in verses 3 through 7. It's the illustration. just follows right as part of the uh, dialogue in, in Proverbs. Proverbs 3 through 7. Through the lips of the forbidden woman drips honey, and her words are smoother than oil. And in the end, she's as bitter as warm wood and as sharp as a double-edged sword. Her feet go down to death. Her steps head straight for Sheol. She doesn't consider the path of life. She doesn't know that her ways are unstable. So now, my sons, listen to me and don't turn away from the words of my mouth. So Solomon's giving an illustration. We just said about following his, the, the, the teachings. See, he gives us a lesson about an adulteress. The beginning of seduction starts with flattery. Flattery includes ego, pride, self-esteem, vanity, glory, and self-glorification, which includes self-glorification and self-inflation. Uh, self You've probably seen many people in the news that are that way. Lips of honey being in the relationship between a husband and wife uh, are, are, are those that are truly in love. If you're truly in love, you have lips, lips of honey. Love includes mutual edification and submitting to one another as an obedience to Christ. One is not obeying the command of Christ to love one another if there's no edification or submitting to each other in marriage. Now the son here has already previously been instructed about the use of discretion. In these verses 3 through 7 again, we see the practical illustration. The image of dripping honey and smoothing an oil culturally refer to flattery, not kisses or food. The forbidden woman has a very important cultural application in these verses. The Hebrew phrase for this uh, forbidden woman actually means a, a, a prostitute. The woman mentioned would actually have been a Gentile as Hebrew women were forbidden from becoming prostitutes. It was a stoning offense for them, so it would be a one-time offense only. A Hebrew could be considered a foreigner if they had no relationship with God. So there is a way that that a Hebrew could be in this situation. What is being said is that some Hebrew women did become prostitutes. The warning being given is that a relationship with such a woman would bring suffering. The phrase sharp as a double-edged sword refers to eternal death in hell. So Solomon is teaching and warning that there is corruption from the charm of an adulteress. And corruption leads one away from the truth and from God. This includes relying on oneself and leading to the desires of the flesh. For us today, rejecting the truth is rejecting Christ Jesus. God uses sexual infidelity to show spiritual infidelity that we have by not believing in him and by not having a relationship with him. A good example is Hosea, chapters one, or chapter one, verses one and two. When the Lord first spoke to Hosea, he said to him, Go and marry a promiscuous wife and have children of promiscuity, for the land is committing blatant acts of promiscuity by abandoning the Lord. Ever witness a man or woman give statements of flattery to a woman or man he or she does not know? Today in the workplace and in church, this is called sexual harassment. It's illegal. Now as we move on, our obedience to truth keeps us on the path of fidelity. Proverbs chapter 5, verses 8 through 10. Keep way far from her. Don't go near the door of her house. Otherwise, you will give up your vitality to others and your years to someone cruel. Strangers will drain your resources and your earnings will end up in a foreigner's house. There's a lot of cultural meaning to these words. But bottom line, we need to stay in the truth. 
So we need to distance ourselves from those who refuse to walk the path of truth, light, and love. This includes those who ignore following the truth of God's instructions. In Old Testament times, and, and the law of the Old Testament, adultery was punishable by death. However, a cruel judge might condemn one to a life of slavery instead, if you were fortunate enough to get before a judge. So a stranger or foreigner would then benefit from your work, because now you're a slave and they're getting the benefits of all your work. These verses are instructing that the price for infidelity is high. The price of infidelity, that is replacing God with our self-will or fleshly desires, will result in the death of our true self. A person involved in, in infidelity, whether physically or spiritually, may lose their health, position, power, and wealth. Most likely, they will not be able to use their spiritual gift that God's given them for building God's kingdom or even witnessing. So your fidelity will enable you to carry God's truth to others. So we are to distance ourselves from others by telling the truth. Actually, I think it's a lot easier to be truthful than to go around lying. It's how you can keep your lies straight. We must cling to our rock, who is Christ Jesus, who is the truth. And this means our priority is to please God, not others. Paul gives us an example of that in Galatians chapter 1, verse 10. For am I now trying to win the favor of people or God? Or am I striving to please people? If I'm still trying to please people, I will not be a slave of Christ. Ego, pride, vanity, as well as desire for status tempts us to put God second in our life. Remember, God uses infidelity to demonstrate our separation from him. Physical infidelity reveals our spiritual infidelity. Infidelity will grieve the Holy Spirit living inside the believer. How can one be of use to God when they're involved in infidelity? And finally, we go to verses 11 through 14, where we see the lack of fidelity will bring us to ruin. At the end of your life, you will lament when your physical body has been consumed, and you will say, how I hated discipline. And how my heart despised correction. I didn't obey my teachers or listen closely to my mentors. I am on the verge of complete ruin before the entire community. Lack of fidelity has a price. Frequently when a sinner has a terminal disease or is nearing death, they lament the decisions they have made in their life. They may despair over their neglect, over the warnings they ignored about obeying God's commandments and rejecting Christ. Jesus gives a warning to those who do not have a relationship with God. Being a child of, of one who has a relationship with God does not grandfather one into God's kingdom. So just because I have a relationship with God does not mean my children automatically have one. Or they automatically, because I do, they get to go to heaven no matter what they do or what they believe. It's everyone stands on their own before God about their faith. Matthew 8, chapter, uh, uh, rather, chapter, Matthew chapter 8, verse 12. But the sons of the kingdom will be thrown into outer darkness. In that place there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Just because your parents are believers does not automatically make you one. You have to do that on your own. As a sinner starts to reflect in their life, when their life starts to end, a period of regret starts to merge me and to wonder, what if? Have you seen the Christian movie, What If? If not, I strongly recommend it. It's, it's totally an outstanding uh, movie. I believe it stars Kevin Sorbo, I think is his name. And it's uh, totally outstanding. Now today, there might be uh, the ones to question if they did not accept Christ as Lord and Savior, if their eternal uh, future really has been compromised by the rejection of Jesus. Think about it. Did they seek after his principles? Did they trust Jesus for everything? The future of those who reject Christ is a, is a lake of fire. Revelation 20, 15. Anyone not found written in the book of life was thrown into the lake of fire. 
So Solomon admits publicly that as a sinner, he has been publicly disgraced. Solomon is, in fact, teaching from the failures of his life. This leads to the importance of what he's teaching. His failure is a result of not obeying or listening to his teachers. And who and or what is our teacher? It's God's holy word, also called the Bible, and the Holy Spirit who talks to us. You are spiritually on the path of fidelity by being obedient to God's words. It's best summed up by, uh, I think, by Philippians chapter 4, verses 5 through 8. Let your graciousness be known to everyone. The Lord is near. Don't worry about anything, but in everything through prayer and petition with thanksgiving, let your requests be known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses every thought, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Finally, brothers, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable, if there's any moral excellence, and if there's any praise, dwell on these things. My challenge for you this week is to consciously follow God's will. That's it. Consciously follow his will. If you've not prayed for the Holy Spirit to come into you, do so right now. You just never know what will happen in the next few minutes or another day. May God bless you and have a, have a uh, wonderful, healthy week. Thank you. Thank you, Pastor Michael. All right, everybody, you guys have a great one, and we'll see you next week.